It was a war fought to uncover weapons of mass destruction. I knew, and I'd been told by President Saddam Hussein himself, that Iraq did not have any weapons of mass destruction. A war in which the British and Americans had expected to be welcomed as liberators. There was a belief that they would capitulate as we got closer and that uh, there would not be much of a fight. Helicopter to land now. A war in which the Iraqi army was supposed to switch sides and help run Iraq. There was nobody to receive the surrender from. We couldn't find them. They weren't there. A war fought in the name of peace and democracy. The technology changes, uh, but the true nature of war doesn't. And it is not clean. It is not uh, antiseptic. A war of miscalculations that did much to shape the Iraq of today. That planning that we did do was based against a false set of assumptions. This is the story of that war and its legacy, told by the people who fought it and endured it. Two months before war, Saddam Hussein met with one of the most senior generals in Iraq's Republican Guard. He was the commander whose divisions would defend the approaches to Baghdad. Rad Majid al-Hamdani was the man America and Britain expected to unleash chemical or biological weapons against their troops. Except he couldn't. <laughs> I knew, and I'd been told by President Saddam Hussein himself, that Iraq did not have any weapons of mass destruction. As a commander of a Republican Guard Corps, it's highly likely I would have been informed if we had these weapons. That didn't happen. Every official source assured me that in Iraq, no one would find evidence of weapons of mass destruction, neither chemical, or biological, because Iraq didn't have any. Britain and America were preparing to fight a war whose central justification did not exist. Much of their intelligence came from Iraqi exile groups who hated Saddam. Privately, some intelligence analysts were appalled by the importance politicians gave to these groups. I got a call and said, hey, listen, we've got an Iraqi National Congress source, and we need you to fly literally around the world. And I sat down with this guy. And I have to tell you, I know more about WMD from my daughter's dirty diapers than this Iraqi National Congress source knew. My fellow citizens, Saddam Hussein must leave Iraq within 48 hours. It is not too late for the Iraqi military to act with honor and protect your country by permitting the peaceful entry of coalition forces to eliminate weapons of mass destruction. Saddam knew the UN had not sanctioned the war. He was defiant. He said, we shall humble the massive armies of the United States at the walls of Baghdad. I shall then lead you westwards to liberate Palestine and the territories occupied by the Israeli Zionists. The coalition planned to begin the invasion with a spectacular opening strike, perhaps the largest assassination attempt in history. Zero hour was set for two days after the president's deadline was due to expire. This was a direct shot at the Saddam Hussein regime in a direct shot at the Ba'athist regime, in a direct shot at an oppressive regime, not the Iraqi people nor their infrastructure. Air planners were targeting no less than 55 men whose names appeared on what was known as the blacklist. One of those who'd drawn up the list worked at the Pentagon in the Defense Intelligence Agency. These 55 guys are basically the Iraqi leadership. And the thought is that if we attack and kill some of the folks on the top 55 list, that the war is either going to be shortened or may stop altogether. Surprise was crucial. Through months of painstaking work, American intelligence thought they had located where their targets worked. By making these strikes the first of the war, 
They hope to catch Saddam's lieutenants before they move to safe locations. But then the White House called. We had intelligence that there is an opportunity to decapitate the regime, to strike and kill Saddam. And do we have the assets that we can respond to this very quickly? Two stealth fighters were prepared. A CIA source in Baghdad claimed he'd seen Saddam enter a secret bunker. Any attack would have to be immediate. The other strikes would have to be abandoned. The president decided to gamble. We were told that the CIA source was without reproach. And, you know, sometimes you just have to take that at face value. We knew that it was a high-priority mission with someone on the ground or some, somebody, some group of people on the ground, but we didn't know who it was. And we attacked the city, one coming in from the east, one coming in from the west. And we dropped simultaneously on uh, the target just to the side of the river there. In Baghdad, it was 5.30 in the morning. Minutes later, cruise missiles also hit the target, which was in the grounds of the Dora farm complex where Saddam's daughters lived. The information from CIA was that they had uh, an amazing source and that Saddam Hussein was basically out of business. There was a belief at the highest levels of the Pentagon and the White House that we had, we had successfully killed Saddam. We got him. That's it. War's over. The problem is, we didn't get him. Shortly thereafter, Saddam is on television. It was the first in a string of intelligence failures. And the attack had wrecked the plan to kill other regime leaders. Once Dora Farm was struck, the Iraqi leadership knew that the war was on. They moved to civilian areas, and they basically left all of those places that were at the, the top levels of the target list. Only after the war would the Americans discover the spy's story of Saddam and his secret bunker was entirely false. Is there a bunker there? The intelligence community thinks there is. Afterwards, you go there, there's no bunker. Is Saddam Hussein there? Everyone thinks he is. Afterwards, no Saddam. What happened? I'm as, as puzzled as you are. The British had been informed, but not consulted. Britain's top commander believed the raid was misconceived because Saddam's corpse would not have been available for display. It was something which was very much an American lead on. They had the intelligence. And if we were to take him out, I would have thought it would be important to better show that we had taken him out. Demonstrable proof. In the Iraqi oil fields just across the border, Special forces watched in case Saddam retaliated by sabotaging oil wells. When news came in that nine were ablaze, the land commander decided he had to attack immediately, a day before he'd intended. We needed to secure the southern oil fields right away. That if we didn't, we ran a unacceptable risk that the regime could possibly sabotage those oil fields, create an environmental disaster. Therefore, we're ready. Let's push this thing forward and let's go. And by God, that's what we executed. The invasion began. The American Fifth Army was to attack Baghdad from the desert west of the Euphrates. The American Marine Corps would attack through the inhabited areas east of the river. The British would secure Iraq's second city, Basra. The 
British began their advance. Failings in the supply system and delays caused by the political controversy over the war meant the troops were short of ammunition and equipment to protect them from chemical and biological weapons. I felt that we were carrying a lot of risk. The mood was one that we were not ready for this, that the soldiers at a personal level were not properly equipped, that we had problems with clothing, uh, we had problems sourcing ammunition. We knew it was in theatre, but we, we, couldn't, uh, we couldn't find it. The British hoped they wouldn't have to fight. The Shia Muslims of Basra in the south had suffered terribly under Saddam. I thought once ground forces crossed into Iraq, that that might be the trigger for a large-scale Shia insurgency. We'd even gone as far as thinking about the possibility of, of, of arming those who were prepared to rebel. But there were no welcoming crowds. Twelve years before, the people of these same villages had risen up after the first President Bush called on them to overthrow Saddam. But the Allies had then failed to support the rising. Tens of thousands of men, women and children were executed or tortured. They stuck a knife into my nose. They pulled out my teeth. This time, the Shias were going to let the coalition do the fighting. We could easily have attacked the regime. We had the weapons. But we were afraid the Americans wouldn't topple Saddam, and that he would then return and take his revenge. On the second night, the main British force approached Basra. The Secret Intelligence Service, MI6, was negotiating by radio with some of the city's commanders. The British wanted the Iraqi army to help them police the city. We told them our argument wasn't with them, it was only with the regime. We said, you know, surrender, and, and you, you can then rejoin your army under a new leadership. We even asked them to come, come and be part of our coalition. It didn't happen. Instead, when the British probed the outskirts of the city, they met with fierce resistance. This is our first major contact with the enemy that we can actually see now. They're on the ground, they're firing tracer, we're firing tracer. Ah! Ah! What's my ah! It was just walk up to tanks with RPGs on the shoulders, trying to get as close as they could. It's very frightening, um, especially when you see the whites in their eyes and they're throwing grenades at you. It's very frightening. It was just a constant barrage for 16 hours. We were told that they were going to surrender in the droves and it was going to be like the first Gulf War and that you would come across hundreds of men walking towards you with a weapon, no weapons and such, but I, mean, I never saw any of that. At first, the British encountered regular troops, but soon they found themselves under attack by paramilitary fighters, often dressed in civilian clothes. They uh, came forward very stealthily using civilian vehicles mounted with RPGs, heavy machine guns, and they used those a lot. They were willing to fight till the end. They were willing to stay there against all odds. The British had met the Fedayeen, a brutal militia commanded directly by Saddam's son, Uday. Recruited and trained from childhood, the Fedayeen were a threat coalition intelligence had largely failed to anticipate. It was quite clear from those engagements that we were now up against something, um, but the size and scale of which we had yet to sort of really work out. Saddam had put his most feared lieutenant in command of Basra, Ali Hassan al-Majid, Chemical Ali, a man the coalition hoped to kill. The guy's a war criminal. He gassed the Kurds. Uh, he basically has 
a very special place in hell set aside for him. Captured soldiers said their units wanted to surrender, but the Fedayeen and Chemical Alley's secret police forced them to fight. They were held to account by somebody behind them with a gun. Or their families were being detained and would suffer the consequences of their failure to act correctly. British troops were also under attack in the nearby town of Azubaya. Their commanders decided they needed to rethink tactics. I spoke to Commander 7 Armour Brigade and said, you work out your plan for Azubar and I'll work out my plan for Basra and let's meet tomorrow morning. Uh, and I remember him arriving uh, and I thought, well, um, I've got some views on this. And he said to me, come around the corner, let's have a quick smoke break before you see my commanders. And he said to me, I've worked out, I could easily get into Azubar now with the most powerful armoured brigade the United Kingdom's ever put in the field. But if I do, I'll trash the place, I'll take unnecessary casualties myself, I will kill lots of civilians, and this can't be right. And I said to him, well, my conclusion was precisely the same for Basra. So within a space of uh, a cigarette, um, we'd both come to the same conclusion. The British encircled the city, but allowed civilians to leave. MI6 agents inside Basra still hoped they could incite an uprising. Some in the American High Command were exasperated. They felt British caution made Saddam look strong. But British forces did not want to risk a bloodbath. Taking down a city quickly would have been inviting us to attack it very hard, rubbleize it, to use one expression, but certainly to go fairly hard. And one of our campaign objectives was to make sure we concentrated on thinking about how we actually rebuilt the infrastructure once the war was over. In Baghdad, Saddam's palaces and ministries had been bombed. It was a spectacle designed to convince the Iraqi people it was safe to overthrow the regime. even if the buildings were empty. You've got to hit something. And so if you don't know where these guys are and you're still developing the intelligence, you're still trying to figure out where they are, the war is on. You've got to hit your best stuff. And here's the best list that we've got, so we're going to go to town on it. The American Marine Corps now planned to cross the Euphrates by capturing key bridges in the town of Nazaria. Like the British at Basra, they expected the local population and the Iraqi army to help. There was a belief that they would capitulate as we got closer and that uh, there would not be much of a fight. But inside Nazaria, Hundreds of Fedayeen fighters were waiting. They'd instilled fear, and they were eager to fight. They would tell us, if I kill an American, the regime will give me one million dinars. And they were tempted by that money. They didn't care about the city. In fact, the people of Nazaria wanted to welcome the Americans. All the key figures, the heads of tribes, the religious leaders, wanted to end the nightmare that had lasted for 35 years. But even before the Marines could attack, a series of events unfolded that led to disaster. It started when a convoy of 18 American trucks drove past the waiting Marines. The 507th Maintenance Company serviced Patriot missile batteries. They weren't frontline troops. They intended to skirt Nazaria and rendezvous with the rest of their unit in the desert to the north. We uh, drove and drove and drove, and then we hit a concrete road. They'd taken a wrong turn. 
Next thing I look around where we're at, and it looks like we're driving through a city and the sun's getting ready to come up. They'd stumbled into Nazaria. Initially, the Iraqi soldiers guarding the key bridge across the Euphrates showed little appetite for a fight. They were actually waving at us, so we thought that they were just glad to see that we were there. The convoy passed straight through the Iraqi front line. Then it turned around to escape. On the turnaround, that's when we actually start receiving fire. The Fedayeen had arrived. We couldn't just really see where it was coming from, but we heard the shots being fired. It was just pop, 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 all over the place. You could really couldn't tell where it was coming from. People hiding behind the buildings, firing their weapons. And I could hear the shots actually piercing the vehicle that I was in. I noticed that I was hit um, in the arm. My hand was one way, and I looked back down, my arm was flipped over. I just tucked my arm and just said, I need to keep firing, you know, I need to try to, we need to pull through. Jackson and the vehicles ahead of him made it through the final Iraqi positions. The vehicles behind still had that gauntlet to run. The first two vehicles managed to get through. But the Fedayeen hit the next three with rocket-propelled grenades. Private Miller ran forward to try and help. It was just a bloody mess. And I looked to see if anyone's alive, and to me, there didn't look to be anybody alive. So I just kept moving forward. In the wreckage was Private Jessica Lynch, later to be mythologized as an American hero when troops rescued her from an Iraqi hospital. At the time, Miller thought she was past help. It looked to me like she was dead as well as everyone else that was in that vehicle. Yeah. More and more Fedayeen arrived. Two American soldiers got out of their vehicle. They ran towards their colleagues. A green car pulled up and two Iraqis got out and shouted at them. So the Americans held up their hands with their guns in the air. But the Iraqis shot them and they fell on their faces. Miller spotted Fedayeen preparing to fire mortars at him. I was shooting them as they were loading the mortar pit. And then finally, they stopped loading it. And the next thing I know, there's like a 360 degree circle around me of them just closing in. So that's when I had to surrender. When Miller and other prisoners of war were paraded on Arab television that afternoon, the ambush seemed a metaphor for a war that wasn't turning out as expected. Eleven Americans had been killed and seven taken prisoner. The Fedayeen thought they'd beaten off an American attack. And fighters who had been thinking of surrender thought again. It invigorated the fighting men. They decided to stay and to fight. Outside Nasiriyah, the Marines still awaited the final order to attack the city. The Marines had received only confused reports about the ambush of the maintenance convoy. They still believed there was little stomach for a fight in the city. But the battle which followed would change the course of the war. I was anxious, a uh, little excited. Uh, nobody really knew what line to hit. 
We were all wearing our cold weather clothing because it was chilly. And uh, it was kind of a grayish dawn. The, uh, that's when the first signs of enemy resistance started. There were mortars impacting about 600 meters away from our forces. Uh, heavy machine guns began to be uh, fired at us. And that gave you an indicator of what was to come. They spotted Iraqi tanks. And by the end of about an hour, we had about nine enemy tanks that had been engaged and destroyed. Now we knew we might have a fight on our hands. American tanks had been rescuing survivors from the earlier ambush. Now, only four had enough fuel to continue the advance. We were running out of daylight, and I did not want to be in the middle of an attack to seize bridges while it was dark. And the colonel at that point was, OK, push. Let's push. Let's take those bridges. There's a lot of firing going on. You can hear it ricocheting off the road beside us. You could hear the fire smacking off the bridge. I can remember seeing an RPG skip across the road in front of us. So I was like, OK, this, this, is, this is for real here. This is, uh, this is bad. Once across the bridge, the tanks moved forward. Suddenly, disaster struck. It was open ground. It appeared to be dry on top, but underneath was, uh, was water. And they just sank to their chassis, and we got, uh, we got stuck. They were coming at us. Right there was an Iraqi that we had just killed. And right over there was four more Iraqis we just killed. And back over on the other side of the building, there was nine Iraqis that were killed by the tanks. Uh, so they were swarming on us. I could really feel the pressure building. They were fearless. They weren't afraid to die. And uh, they just, it was like a human wave attack as they, as they came pushing uh, towards us. Families died on the streets and in their homes. We piled up corpses in front of the mortuary. March the 23rd was a black day for Nazaria, the toughest day. Wherever I went, children would run up to me, pleading for help with dead or wounded people. A marine company advanced towards a key bridge on the northern edge of the city. Iraqi fighters were waiting. They would duck behind a wall and they would fire an RPG or they would pull out an AK-47 and they'd fire at you. They were everywhere, on both sides of the road, high and low, and everybody was shooting. Everywhere in Iraq had become a war zone, and so the civilians had fighters among them, from the army, I'm from the Fedayeen. If the Americans saw you coming out of a street or a building with a gun in your hand, they'd just start shooting. They didn't care if it was a house with civilians in it or a school. Coming through Ambush Alley with all the small arms and RPGs going off, I thought that was bad enough until I crossed that northern bridge. The land is blowing up all around you. Some of the artillery rounds hit so close they bounce you off the ground. It's extremely frightening. An American aircraft arrived overhead, but instead of helping, it attacked the American position, adding to the casualties. I was thinking that the casualties would be real high, extremely high. An armored vehicle tried to take the wounded to the rear. An RPG came sailing through the air. It plunged into the open troop hatch of the AAV, and there was just a, a catastrophic explosion as the, uh, as the Amtrak blew up with its occupants inside. I had 18 of my Marines were, were killed in action and 14 wounded that day uh, that were taken off the battlefield, so basically lost about uh, one-fourth of our combat power on that day from one company. So, you know, emotionally, from that standpoint, thinking about the families and the Marines, and, and uh, it was very difficult. After that point, we never heard anything about capitulation or anything after that. Uh, uh, people approached the Iraqis, I think, with a much different uh, perspective. Helicopter to land now. We got a critical patient needs to get out of here. 
In one day, 29 Americans had died in Nazaria. With them died all hope that the Iraqi people would help the coalition overthrow the regime. It didn't happen. Uh, it didn't happen at An Nasiriyah. Um, it didn't happen at other places in the south. What worried the Americans even more was the thought of what lay ahead. The south was meant to be the easy part. In the western desert, American troops were now advancing towards the Republican Guard. The closer we got to Baghdad, we expected a, a tougher fight. We expected the Republican Guard to be the formation that we were going to have to deal with, and we expected it to be a much more difficult and much more uh, resolute defense. Hidden in the countryside south of Baghdad, were four Republican Guard divisions, perhaps 40,000 men. Their commander was confident he could produce a stalemate. I thought we could hold out for two or three months, even six months, without the war reaching any conclusion. I thought we'd be able to turn Iraq into a mini Vietnam. I didn't think the Americans would be prepared to fight man to man. 32 Apache helicopters, the most deadly tank hunters in the world, were ordered forward. Each cost $22 million. Their job, to search out the Republican Guard's Medina division. The regime resided in Baghdad, and the Medina division sat between us and Baghdad. The plan was for a massive raid that very night. But as they prepared, they were being watched. We established a force to stay behind enemy lines and gather information. They wore civilian clothes. They didn't carry any weapons. They used mobile phones to send and receive information. When the Apaches took off, the Iraqi forces were ready. For about the first 10 minutes, we were OK. We really hadn't faced any fire. I'd seen a couple tracer strings, but that was about it. But the ambush was about to be sprung. The power grid of the entire town that we were going over had gone black and uh, came back on within a few seconds. That's when. Everybody started reporting taking heavy fire. Uh, we found out later that that was like a signal that they were using for people to go up on top of their roofs and shoot. Fire was coming from the houses, the waterways, trees, shrubs, vehicles that are out there. I was on the radio when I got hit. I've got earplugs in, I've got a helmet on, all the noise of the aircraft but I could hear it enter my neck. Uh, I didn't want to touch my neck. I assumed that the front of my throat was gone. The Apaches were forced to turn back before they even reached the Medina division. I came over the squadron command radio and told all air crews to shoot at everybody that shot at them. You know you're firing into areas where there are houses, where there's there are communities, and you don't want to have collateral damage. You, you try your best not to have collateral damage. But it became fairly evident that, in fact, you were going to have to, in order to, to survive this, you were going to have to return fire. One Apache was shot down and its crew captured. Almost every helicopter was seriously damaged. I remember coming back feeling very unsure of what really just happened there. Was it that we were, the, we were one unit that had encountered an extreme amount of resistance and therefore had that happen, or was this as a broad spectrum? I really didn't know at that point, but I do know that for us at that point, we were going to have some time to think about it because our airplanes were extremely battle damaged. The Republican Guard remained largely unscathed. The Apache pilot's faith in American intelligence was shaken. It was useless. <laughs> it really was useless. At the risk of uh, 
never making it above captain. <laughs> like I said, uh, there was definitely something wrong with the intelligence flow. Nothing seemed to be working out quite as expected. Now, to add to the coalition's problems, a sandstorm of biblical proportions began to swirl across southern Iraq. You could have been convinced that it was the apocalypse because it, it, it was that nasty out there. For a few hours, it was just an orange haze. Within about five minutes, it turned to pitch black out there. I heard a guy's walking to go to the bathroom about 20 yards from the vehicle. And they spend the next three hours looking for their vehicle again, you know. The weather really sucked. You could literally not see more than about 30 or 40 feet with your naked eye. And now came another surprise for Allied intelligence. Fedayeen fighters left the cities and attacked the supply lines of the lead units. They just kept coming, and they kept coming, and they kept coming. We started to realize that uh, they, they weren't afraid to fight, and more importantly, they weren't afraid to die. The advance stalled. The US Defense Secretary, Donald Rumsfeld, had pressured his generals to invade with smaller forces than they'd asked for. The man leading the attack on Baghdad was concerned an immediate attack would be reckless. I wasn't real comfortable with the troop levels. I was very reluctant to head Baghdad because I wanted to make damn sure that when we did it, we were going to be decisive and successful. In desert meetings, tempers flared. In our profession, there's no such thing as a calm, measured discussion because what we're talking about is life and death. So there are passionate discussions. But General McKiernan was determined to retain the initiative. I said, we're going to have to accept some risk. And I want you to continue your attack rapidly to the north. Fast is better than slower. Fast is more lethal than slower. Fast is more final. The American army now prepared to attack Baghdad. The lead units had to funnel through a mile-wide gap between a lake and the city of Kabbalah, the so-called Kabbalah Gap, and then assault across the Euphrates. My commanders clearly understood that as soon as we moved through the Karbala Gap, it was going to be one fight all the way to Baghdad. The Americans could not detect any Iraqi forces defending the gap. The man leading the spearhead unit feared that the area had been cleared for a chemical attack. If there was one place that he could have used chemical weapons very successfully uh, was at the Karbala Gap. That night, a signals intercept meant coalition troops were put on alert for imminent attack. We intercepted a high-level radio transmission uh, that had uh, a simple word passed, it was blood, um, and we, we thought we knew what that meant. Just before dawn, the Americans attacked into the gap. There was no chemical attack. Iraqi forces had pulled back, not to create a killing field, but because they felt too vulnerable in open desert. <laughs> There was a general order that there should not be a single Iraqi soldier to the west of the Euphrates River. As the Americans attacked, Hamdani's phone rang. He was summoned to Baghdad to meet Saddam's son, Kusay. Kusay told me he had an important message for me from President Saddam Hussein. 
The message was that everything that had happened over the past two weeks was a strategic deception, that the main enemy attack would come from the north of Baghdad. And therefore, I should pull out all my troops that were south of Baghdad. Hamdani protested that at that very moment the Americans were attacking from the south. Kusay approached me. He was almost whispering. He said, General Rad, are you sure of what he was saying? I answered, yes, as sure as I'm talking with you now. He knew I was telling the truth. I could see it in his face. But still, he ordered me to move my troops to the north. He gave the order not as an order from him, but as an order that he was obliged to obey. The regime was crumbling. As I left Baghdad, I looked at it as though I was seeing it for the last time. I could imagine the destruction to come. The spearhead American unit was through the Kabbalah Gap. It raced towards its next objective. Kabbalah Gap itself, if you seize the gap, you still don't win. You got to get across the river. Months before, the planners had decided this bridge would carry the U.S. Army towards the Iraqi capital. General Hamdani was fully aware of its importance. This bridge could carry more than 150 tons in weight and was wide enough for armored troops to cross. I gave the commander of the demolition force clear, written, and verbal orders that as soon as he felt the enemy was close to the bridge, he should blow it up. We fully anticipated this bridge to be uh, mined, uh, set with demolitions, and rigged uh, to explode. And we wanted to capture the bridge intact. I definitely saw wires. We wanted to destroy that wire, or we wanted to kill the guy who was in charge of that wire. American engineers scrambled into boats and assaulted across the river to cut the demolition wires. The first boat gets about 25% of the way across the river, and we start taking fire from the far side. Suddenly, the boat's engine failed. Hibner thought his men were doomed. They're sitting ducks. I thought, my God, I just sent these guys to their death. But smoke hid them from the Iraqis, and they got across. We're on the far side of the bank now taking really incredible amounts of small arms fire. We had cut all the, the wires, all the deck cord. We were very vulnerable at this point. We needed some heavy firepower. So we assault across the bridge. We just pushed right through just going as fast as we could to get a bigger foothold on the other side to get more troops across the bridge. We didn't take any prisoners east of that bridge. East of that bridge, nobody surrendered. We had finally found the Iraqi uh, Republican Guard. By evening, the Americans controlled the bridge. Four hours earlier, General Hamdani had been told to withdraw to the north of Baghdad. Now he was ordered to turn his units round and counterattack. My own opinion was not to attack the Americans at this point. I felt we should surround them, contain them, then launch an offensive with a brigade of special forces. But the high command insisted on an immediate offensive, which we were not ready for. 
the American tank crews were in their new positions east of the Euphrates. At 8 o'clock, it started to get dark, and I said, hey, you know, let, let's try to get some rest. There's nothing going on. First sleep I've had in more than 24, 36 hours. We got the first report tank uh, uh, moving uh, from east to west. We started to get reports of infantry moving in the north. So now it looked like some sort of coordinated attack uh, to try to retake the bridge. General Hamdani had mustered his most elite troops, a brigade from the Medina Division. All of a sudden, I see this, this, this armored vehicle pop up in front of me at 800 meters. Shot that one, and it was a humongous ball of flame, and we had shrapnel coming back down on us. Iraqi tanks were advancing in a column down the road. We destroyed upwards of six T-72s, uh, and we pretty much stopped the entire uh, brigade that was coming down us in their tracks. It became a slaughter. There was guys running up and down the road, there's big balls of fire going everywhere, some small on fire. We're, we're still engaging with machine guns, so every time we see someone run across the road, we fire machine guns at them. I didn't have a single tank intact. They were all either damaged or destroyed. I didn't have a single vehicle left. The battle reached a point where I myself, the army commander, was fighting with the Kalashnikov. By 5.30, it, they, were, it was, they were completely destroyed. Uh, the 10th Brigade had, had uh, ceased to exist. I remember going there that morning and looking down that road and just unbelievable, could not imagine what was going through the Iraqi minds that night as they were trying to assault that position. It's hard to describe it. it body parts just littered across the road. Vehicles still burning, still too hot to even get close to. The smell in the air there's a smell I'll never, ever forget. Uh, the, the, the burning flesh. The Americans hadn't suffered a single casualty, but they were fearful, expecting this would be the first of many such encounters. The battle for Baghdad had begun. Mm -hmm. 